Okay, I think we can uh, we can start. Um, Professor Makam Dengue, if I can pass over to you, please. Thank you, thank you very much, uh, Liz Lisbeth. Uh, welcome to everybody uh, to the first edition of the IISD uh, University of Geneva Trade Knowledge uh, Series. My name is Makan Moiz Beng. I'm a professor of international law at the Faculty of Law of the University of Geneva, and I happen also to be the director of the Department of Public International Law and international organization of the same university. Uh, it is really a great pleasure to launch uh, this new series in partnership with uh, ISD. I guess that some of you know that uh, it is not the first time that uh, ISD and the University of Geneva are, are collaborating. Uh, we actually launched in 2017 uh, a series called the ISD University of Geneva learn sharies on investment disputes where we, we we had the chance at different occasions to discuss the linkages between uh, the investment regime and sustainable development um, issues and uh, i have to say that uh, uh, those series on on investment uh, disputes have been uh, very successful and uh, it is uh, thanks or because of that success that we, we we decided uh, to launch uh, now a, a new a new series and this time focusing on 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 trade. Uh, I was telling to Natalie Bernasconi, who unfortunately cannot make it today, and to to Lisbeth Casier, who have been very kind to approach me for this new series on 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 trade knowledge. Uh, I've been telling them that for for a long time. We were talking a lot about the trade, about the multilateral trading system, and at a certain point, the multilateral trading system uh, lost a bit of attention, and and a lot of attention was put on on the investment regime. So I'm very happy that we are now coming back also and and putting more and more attention uh, on the on the trade regime, on the WTO, because uh, the, the 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 issues that are arising today within the multilateral trading system are as important as, uh, as, as ever. So I'm really thankful to Natalie Bernasconi, Lisbeth Cassier, and Sofia Baligno for associating the University of Geneva to this, uh, this new series. So for the first edition, we have chosen a, a topic on trade and, uh, and, and, and health um, with a subtitle, what the word health uh, assembly outcomes mean for for the for the trade regime. Many of us know that uh, the trade and health debate or the trade and health uh, nexus uh, is maybe one of the most complex, one of the most controversial uh, aspect of the of what we call the trade end uh, debate. Uh, I believe that uh, despite many of the discussions that have been taking place uh, during the last. Uh, 20 years on, on the relationship between trade and health, there are still many aspects, many issues uh, to be explored. And uh, in the current context of global pandemia, uh, the, the relationship, the interaction between trade and health is even more important uh, to, to, to explore. I, I remember that uh, 15 years ago, I was involved in the negotiations of the international health regulations, the WHO international regulations, and, and trade was actually one of the sensitive topic uh, during the negotiations of the international health uh, regulations. And uh, uh, some of you know a bit the, the, the details of the international health regulations. You know that trade is actually even mentioned in article two of the international health regulations that, are de that is dealing with the purpose and scope of the international health regulation. So we have an explicit mention to trade there, but I still believe, I think I'm among the people who believe that, uh, that the international health regulations have been quite shy uh, with, with trade and that there was much more uh, to tackle when it comes to trade and uh, global responses to, 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 to international uh, pandemia. So I think that it is now the opportunity to come back on, 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 on these aspects to maybe discuss uh, uh, ideas, ideas for the future. There are many voices that are calling for the 
amendment or the revision of the international health regulations and any revision of the international health regulations would have to better in my view regulate and 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 and, and handle uh trade 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 aspects so i think that this is a very timely uh discussion i'm very thankful to our two experts uh dr suri moon and mr tiru balasubra maniam for having accepted our, our invitation i'm sure that the discussion will be very stimulating and i'm looking forward to 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 also to the debate with uh, the the participants to this uh, to this webinar so without further ado i will give now the floor to to lisbeth casier uh, from isd to to moderate this discussion thank you very much again Thank you so much, uh, Professor Benge, to, uh, to introduce and, and for, for your warm welcome uh, to all the participants, also on behalf of, uh, of ISD. Uh, I want to welcome everyone here uh, and, and also thank the University uh, of Geneva for uh, embarking with ISD on this new trade knowledge uh, series. And of course, uh, a warm welcome to, to our speakers today. Thank you so much for having accepted this, uh, this invitation. We're very much looking forward uh, to your presentation and, and this discussion. Um, as Professor Mbengi was already um, mentioning, so the, the trade regime, um, multilateral and, and other governance platforms these days is impacting the sustainable development trajectory and, and the sustainable development goals in a, in a very diverse and complex manner. And our aim with this knowledge series is really to, to contribute to unpacking some of these complex interactions, to share knowledge, so that we also ensure that tomorrow's trade governance system is actually designed to deliver on the sustainable development goals. And then as a first of this series, we need to, uh, chose to look at those interactions between trade and health, um, and where we can highlight, of course, a variety of issues there um, between, the, between the two. Um, we've chosen uh, to go back to the World Health Assembly that took place in, in May this year and introduce you to some of the outcomes and initiatives that have an interaction with the multilateral trading uh, regime as we know it today. And for that, we're delighted to have with us today Dr. Suri Moon, of the Graduate Institute uh, for International and Development Studies. She's the co-director of the Global Health Center and a visiting lecturer. Um, Dr. Surimun has an enormous uh, specialized policy expertise on many topics in relation to global governance and, and health, uh, ranging from how to achieve more globally equitable innovations and access to medicine, to how to make trade investment and intellectual property rules more health sensitive, um, with uh, an enormous uh, uh, background uh, and, uh, and knowledge uh, that she also built uh, from uh, teaching at the Harvard Chan School of Public Health, co-founding a forum on global governance for health uh, as a focal point for research, debates, and strategic convening on the issues. Um, Dr. Shirimun, thank you very much for being uh, with us today. Then I would also like to introduce our second speaker. Uh, this is uh, Thiru Balasubramaniam from the Knowledge Ecology International, or KEI. And uh, KEI is a not-for-profit uh, NGO that searches for better outcomes, including new solutions to the management of knowledge resources, with a focus on social justice, justice and the management of knowledge resources in uh, fairer and more efficient ways to respond to the human needs. Um, Thiru is an economist with an extensive expertise in policy analysis and represents KEI in Geneva in various multilateral fora um, related to, uh, to some of the, the issues we're, we're talking about today, ranging from WHO, WIPO uh, and the WTO. Very briefly, before we start, uh, just a couple of house rules. We will definitely ensure we have enough time for discussion. We hope to have a 30 minutes discussion after our two speakers uh, take the floor. And we have a, a Q&A session in which you can drop some questions in the, the Q&A box on the bottom of your screen. So to all our attendees, um, please feel free during uh, the presentations to already drop some questions there. We'll, uh, we hope to respond to as many of them as possible. 
And during the Q&A, you also have the opportunity to raise hands uh, during the discussion if you would like to take the floor. And with that, um, I would like to invite uh, Dr. Sui Moon to, uh, to share her presentation with us. Uh, and thank you very much. Thank you so much. Let me just take a moment to um, put my slides up. Here we go. Okay. Can you see them okay? Yes, perfect. Okay, great. Okay. So first, I'd really like to thank uh, Professor Mbeng at the University of Geneva and uh, Lisbeth Kazia, you and your colleagues at the um, International Institute for Sustainable Development for inviting me and giving me the opportunity to speak on a topic that is near and dear to my, my heart um, and has indeed kind of risen back up on, on the global agenda. I plan to speak uh, for about 15 minutes um, as, as instructed, and I really look forward to back and forth uh, with the, the audience, with the participants, so I hope you will not hesitate to uh, pose your, your questions and um, questions and comments. And just a quick uh, overview, I'll begin with a few comments on the political context within which the World Health Assembly took place. Um, uh, highlight what I think was uh, particularly notable uh, in terms of what was in the WHA resolution and what was not in the resolution uh, as it relates to the trade regime, and then close with a few reflections um, from a health perspective uh, on, on the trade regime itself. So first, in terms of the political context, I think uh, it's important to recognize that this really was a historic World Health Assembly. Uh, and it was historic in a number of different ways. I think one, the level of political participation was uh, uh, much more high level, I would say, than, than we're used to seeing in, um, in health. And this included a number of heads of state, uh, presidents and prime ministers, uh, who are usually, you know, maybe there's one, maybe you get two, but, but we, we had one after another. Uh, and this really signaled, I think, the importance uh, of the WHO and the importance of the WHA as a place for bringing together the global community during this historic uh, pandemic. Of course, the, the singular focus of the assembly uh, was on COVID-19, and this is also very unusual. Normally, the assembly has um, dozens of, of topics that it's trying to, trying to address within a short period of time. So this was quite unique. Of course, it all happened online here in Geneva. We were on um, on quite strict lockdown, uh, and it it shone an unprecedented spotlight on the World Health Organization, both in a in a positive and a negative way. I would say it really. I mean, this pandemic has uh, reminded the world of how important the WHO is, what an important role it plays for the well-being of all countries, uh, whether wealthy or. Uh, or or not, um, but WHO has never been uh, quite so closely scrutinized and has never been, um, to my knowledge, as openly uh, politically attacked as it has been during the last few months. And so this really was a, a quite um, historic bringing together of, of all the key players at the international level. Um, much of the kind of broader chatter about the geopolitical context really focused on uh, the superpower rivalry between the the U.S. and China, and I do think that was uh, important. I'll get uh, I'll get to that in a bit more detail in a second. Uh, but what I do think the assembly demonstrated was that Europe and the European Union, in particular, is determined uh, and very willing to play a robust global leadership role. Uh, and if anything, if there is a political vacuum that U.S. withdrawal from the global system has left, it's Europe that is really stepping into it, uh, even more than uh, than China or any other any other country. Um, this assembly was also a big test for multilateralism. Uh, it might seem like years ago, I, every month seems like a year <laughs> this, past, um, uh, this past year, but I, I think that leading up to the assembly, there were many, many questions about the degree to which there would be any international cooperation. You know, the month leading up to the assembly had been characterized by uh, a real sort of uh, turning inward of countries that had been directly affected by the pandemic. And this really was a major test. Could a, um, could a resolution, in fact, be agreed upon by consensus at the assembly? It certainly was not a guarantee going into the assembly. Uh, ultimately, of course, as, as most of you are, are probably aware, that resolution was 
has in fact adopted by consensus and by 146 co-sponsors. Um, and so this really is, of course, most countries, most people uh, in the world are represented, uh, not just in terms of agreeing to it, but in co-sponsoring the resolution, signaling their political support. And of course, this is not just a story about US, China and the European Union, but we, we should keep in mind that about 100 of these countries were developing countries. And so a very, very strong message of support for WHO, for multilateralism uh, coming from, uh, from developing countries. I think these are all important pieces of the, the political context. Um, so what was in the resolution? I would say plenty of controversy signaling that there were tough diplomatic negotiations going into it. So first, support to WHO. Um, in a normal year, this would not be very controversial, but this was a year in which agreement at the UN Security Council and at the G7 had been blocked because the US was opposed to language uh, expressly um, uh, expressing support for WHO. And so this, uh, this was an important message that was included in the resolution, which the US did, um, did join by, by consensus. Uh, there was a paragraph that was included uh, asking the WHO and the World Organization for Animal Health and the Food and Agriculture Organization to continue their work to identify the zoonotic source of the virus and the route of introduction. And this was potentially a, a sensitive matter for China. The mission, in fact, to go and negotiate the terms of this investigation has just left, um, I think, about a, a week ago now, went, went to China about a week ago. Uh, so this was this was not a given, again, going into the, the negotiations. Um, an evaluation of WHO and the international response was also agreed upon at the earliest appropriate moment, a evaluation that would be impartial, independent, and comprehensive. And the two co-chairs of this evaluation have also just been named. So we see that these were, um, you know, these were not easy items to, to get agreement on, but there has already been movement to, to implement um, the decisions taken at the assembly. And this was a, uh, a key demand of the US, uh, and it was again not obvious that other countries would be willing to um uh, to go along with this demand. Last but not least, an explicit mention of sexual and reproductive health uh, and rights, which was also strongly opposed um, by the US. And I, I mentioned the US not because it's the only important player, of course, at the assembly, but because a number of the strong objections to key provisions were uh, spearheaded by, um, by the US. So in terms of the um, resolution now with a focusing a bit more tightly on trade, uh, what was in it? Access to medicines and intellectual property remained at the top of the agenda. Uh, this is not surprising considering how essential health technologies are to getting this pandemic under control. I wanted to just um, note as a reminder that prior to the assembly, there had been two uh, general assembly resolutions that were passed on COVID and the second one focused explicitly on ensuring global access to medicines, vaccines, and medical equipment. Um, this resolution, however, did not include very specific language on uh, flexibilities in the TRIPS agreement or flexibilities um, as, as articulated in the Doha Declaration. And these were important, uh, I would say, an, an important added uh, political uh, added concreteness and an added political support that was expressed in the WHA um, resolution for the, uh, the right to use TRIPS flexibilities to ensure adequate access to technologies to respond to, uh, to COVID. What was also included was a mention of immunization as a global public good. And this phrase, global public good, is one that got a lot of airtime during the assembly. I mentioned a couple minutes ago that a number of heads of state, including the president of China, uh, the president of France, the president of the European Commission, all spoke about uh, the importance of making vaccines globally available to all as a global public good. And there have been lots of debates as to well, what exactly does that imply? And I think the key idea is that everybody in the world is able to access, uh, nobody is excluded from accessing um, the benefits of immunization or the benefits of um, of vaccines. Uh, also notable in the resolution were clear references to innovation, uh, in particular mention of open innovation. And I think in the past uh, in resolutions there had been a lot of emphasis on access but not necessarily on the innovation side of the equation. And again uh, uh, a second mention of Doha and TRIPS in relation to requests that international organizations support countries in making full use of these flexibilities as needed to make sure that they can produce and get access to 
uh, to the technologies um, that they need. It's important to see these, these um, key mentions in the text of the resolution also in the context of what had been happening in terms of IP debate outside the WHA. So we've seen in the last six months a number of very significant national and regional moves to strengthen uh, IP flexibilities, including legislative or policy changes across a range of countries, either uh, changes that have been proposed and are under consideration or changes that have already been uh, adopted or implemented. And I think what is quite notable here is the presence of high income countries who have traditionally been on the other side of the, um, of the policy debate. So here you see mention of Canada for example, France and Germany. Uh, France and Germany are, of course, uh, not only large high-income countries, but are home to very significant pharmaceutical industries. Um, Israel issued a compulsory license on an HIV medicine in the early days when it was um, considered to be a potential, uh, potential, potentially useful therapy to treat COVID-19. And so this is a real shift from the previous political dynamics that we had seen. We've also seen patent challenges being launched by civil society to Remdesvir, one of the first products shown to be effective. Um, and these have been launched uh, in India and in Argentina. Uh, discussion that high income countries should reconsider uh, opting into the system uh, under TRIPS, uh, sometimes called the Paragraph 6 system or TRIPS Article 31 bis, um, which allows countries to uh, make use of flexibilities that allow them to import products that are made under compulsory license elsewhere. And this is really critical because there is not a single country in the world that has, a, um, that has access to the production of every health technology that it needs. And this has become painfully obvious in the early days and, and still today, but certainly in the early days of the pandemic, when many countries, including here in Switzerland, we could not get enough masks, we could not get enough uh, rubbing alcohol, we could not get enough um, reagents for diagnostics in one of the wealthiest countries in the world, again, with a very, very um, sophisticated pharmaceutical uh, industrial base. And so for countries to make sure that they could make use of every possible policy measure in order to make sure they have access to the health technologies they need, including the high income countries, um, this is really something that has, I think, um, risen again to the top of the agenda. Last but not least, uh, the European Parliament, I think, endorsed a number of these moves in a resolution last week that I will um, leave to, to Thiru to uh, speak about in, in more detail. Uh, about one week after the Health Assembly, it's also very significant that the WHO launched its COVID-19 technology access pool uh, known as CTAP. And this pool incorporates and, and asks uh, patent holders and research funders and governments to pool uh, knowledge, intellectual property, such as patents and data. So it's not only limited to patents, but it's really related to all of the um, knowledge goods that are required in order to ensure access to health health technologies. This was a proposal that was initially uh, put on the table by the government of Costa Rica. It was ultimately, was ultimately joined by 40 other countries. And these countries span the income spectrum. Again, we're seeing high income countries, including some in Europe, joining uh, middle and low income countries in um, trying to find new solutions for ensuring both innovation and access to COVID-19 technologies. Um, let me turn now to what was not in the resolution because this is also very important. Uh, as I've already mentioned, there have been very significant export bans on a number of essential goods. You can see on the slide in front of you um, all of the different types of products that were covered uh, by export restrictions or on the other side of the coin, liberalization. So basically, if a country had something already, whether it was food or, or medicines, they would restrict exports and whatever it didn't have, let's say I needed to import masks from my, my neighbor, it would liberalize restrictions to try to facilitate those. But you really had a trend of countries uh, really concerned about their own needs, looking inward, uh, rather than, of course, concerned about necessarily liberalizing global trade. And it's very logical. It makes some um, uh, it makes a lot of sense. If we look at the um, uh, the types of countries that implemented these measures, they again range across all income groups, uh, but you see that there's a, a greater concentration or a more frequent use of these types of trade restrictions in the upper middle and high income countries. And one thing to note is that um, I was struck when Professor Meng mentioned earlier the mention of trade in the, in the negotiation of the international health regulations. This is a very, very different kind of trade restriction than what we're used to seeing in the context of outbreaks. What we're used
used to seeing is that one country or maybe a small group of countries will be experiencing an outbreak and then other countries block their products. They might block, for example, the import of pork from Mexico during the H1N1 um, uh, swine flu epidemic that started in, in, in 2009. And those are the types of measures that have been debated in the past. You know, we need to find ways of getting around these types of unjustified trade restrictions. What we've seen with, with COVID is really the, the, the opposite. Uh, but again, I would say a commonality is that the trade regime has not uh, demonstrated itself as able yet to, to address these types of challenges. So um, export bans and the legality of these export bans has seldom been, been questioned, neither by um, legal trade scholars nor in the health sector. And if you look at this text from the uh, WHA resolution, you can see that the uh, basically the resolution said, yeah, these restrictions are not great, but just make sure they're temporary, they're specific, and you have exceptions for humanitarian organizations. So nowhere in the resolution does it say you should not have such restrictions, or there's the, nor, nor does it condemn them in any kind of strong language. And so really there's quite a lot of acceptance and, and I would say um, perhaps understanding that governments will put in place export restrictions to protect their own interests in a time of um, uh, of a pandemic. Uh, the big question, of course, is to what extent does this weaken confidence in the global trade system? And related to this is, of course, that there has been revived interest in local production, whether of PPE or uh, diagnostics, drugs, and vaccines, not only for health purposes, but also as a means to uh, advance industrial development and also now for national security. And this does raise questions about the extent to which TRIPS and the trade regime overall um, facilitates technology transfer. TRIPS Article 66.2 is supposed to, uh, in fact, requires measures to facilitate technology transfer to the least developed countries, but we know from research that it has um, hardly made a, a difference. Um, it has also raised questions about the permissibility of public subsidies and other policies that might be needed if governments want to, in fact, start infant industries. They want to begin local production. You usually need quite a lot of public support, certainly in the early years. Will that kind of support be allowed or disallowed by, uh, by trade rules? For example, if you want to preferentially purchase domestically produced, um, domestically produced goods. Last but not least, uh, it's no secret that underlying health conditions such as diabetes, heart disease, cancers, and others increase the risk of developing severe illness from uh, COVID-19. And this raises the question as to whether trade and investment rules um, will allow for national regulation of alcohol, tobacco, sugar, and, and other goods. Um, this was not mentioned in the uh, in the resolution. Let me just um, close now with a few quick uh, reflections. I think one of the, the unifying themes across all of these developments is a concern about having policy space, adequate policy space for health in the trade regime, whether that policy space is political or legal. Oftentimes the legal space is clear, for example, the use of compulsory licensing, clearly uh, legally allowed, um, but the political space is often much more constrained. And I see, you see this uh, with respect to IP rules, in particular with moves by high income countries to broaden that policy space um, for the use of flexibilities themselves. Uh, we see this in terms of concerns about being able to put in place local production and with the regulation of unhealthy goods, as I just mentioned, such as tobacco, alcohol, etc. cetera. Um, the, the second comment I wanted to put on the table is regarding financing. So health is often the weaker ministry in a national government. It's often considered the expense rather than the income generating uh, activity that the trade ministry or the ministry of finance uh, represents. And many of the, um, uh, I would say one of the reasons, uh, one of the reasons, certainly not the only, but one of the reasons why many countries are not fully prepared to deal with the pandemic is because it's been hard to mobilize the money to build national health systems. And so one of the questions that comes up is, can we look at the trade system or the trade regime as a way to generate resources for investment in health? For example, can we have trade related taxation um, that would finance health and ultimately protect trade from the kinds of massive, massive disruptions that we've seen? over the last six months. Uh, last but not least, it's no secret we're living in a time of rising nationalism that is challenging international rules and institutions in an unprecedented way. Uh, my own 
uh, emerging conclusion is that we need to ensure that there is adequate flexibility in both the health and trade regime if we want to make a international rules-based system more durable or more resilient to challenges from uh, this rise of nationalism. That if we don't have adequate flexibility and policy space built in, this will lead to a breaking of a rules-based health and trade order rather than a reinforcement of that order. Um, so with that, let me close and just thank my two colleagues, uh, Marcel Lavier and Anna Bazurki for their assistance in putting together this presentation. Thank you so much, uh, Siri, for this uh, excellent uh, presentation uh, and also for, uh, for your final reflections there, which I think is, is worth uh, coming back to, um, perhaps both by, uh, by Tiru, um, but also by the, by the audience to, um, to keep thinking about, about those as, as next steps in this space as well. Um, Tiru, uh, without further ado, I'm going to, to pass the mic uh, to you um, for making some comments uh, on Suri's uh, presentation and, and some of the questions she asks at the end, um, but perhaps also to reflect uh, on, on your experience of things that you've been seeing happening at, for example, the, the TRIPS Council and how the discussions from the WHO are also being, being reflected there. So thank you so much for being with us and over to you. Thanks, Lisbeth, and uh, thanks also to the University of Geneva for uh, uh, providing this opportunity to comment on uh, uh, Professor Moon's uh, uh, lecture. And in the time allotted, um, I would like to address some of these legal and policy challenges uh, referred to by Professor Moon, both uh, uh, addressed at the World Health Assembly level and also uh, in informal discussions at the TRIPS Council, including on IP rules, uh, technology transfer, and access. So when we look at the political landscape, um, I would point out uh, the date April 15th, uh, 2020. That is the date uh, Donald Trump announced his intention to withhold funding from the WHO. Coincidentally, on the same day, the EU submitted its uh, zero draft of the resolution on the COVID-19 response. Now, in the resolution's note verbal, um, it stated, and I quote, we are living in extraordinary times and we see this assembly as an extraordinary opportunity for health ministers of all WHO member states to demonstrate their solidarity and their common resolve to overcome the challenges we all face in responding to the pandemic. The virus knows no borders and neither should our collective response. It is only by working together in cooperation with all partners and in support under the leadership of WHO that we will prevail." End quote. Now, despite the weighty rhetoric, uh, the original draft of the resolution contained zero uh, references to TRIPS flexibilities. Instead, the original text uh, contained an anodyne reference to uh, respective obligations resulting from international treaties. To its credit, the original text did contain a reference to the voluntary pooling of intellectual property. Um, and during the intersessional negotiations, countries including Botswana and Canada uh, called for specific language on universal, non-exclusive, and open licensing, and references to sharing data and know-how. Unfortunately, uh, this language did not pass muster. Now, on to uh, some of the uh, references to uh, IP flexibilities that uh, Suri raised. Now, during the tortuous two and a half weeks of negotiations, countries including Zimbabwe, Indonesia, India, and Kenya succeeded in beefing up the final text uh, uh, of the COVID resolution to include at least uh, three separate uh, references to um, TRIPS flexibilities. Now, interestingly, um, the, uh, at the end of the negotiation, the uh, Financial uh, Times reported uh, uh, stating that, and I quote, African ambassadors in Geneva said that US diplomats had sought to persuade them to support a dilution of language in the resolution, but that they had refused. 
Now, I think prior to this, uh, you know, extraordinary situation with uh, COVID, you would not have seen this. But uh, in the end, um, um, the African group uh, stood by their guns and this language stayed in. Uh, and also uh, one other um, consequence though was that uh, the United States um, disassociated itself from references to these flexibilities and also to sexual and reproductive uh, rights. Now, as Suri mentioned, fresh off the heels of the assembly, WHO launched um, the COVID-19 technology access pool, uh, which as she said, was joined by 40 countries from around the world, uh, which included uh, high income countries like um, the Netherlands, Luxembourg, Portugal, and also some other developing countries, including uh, Brazil, Malaysia, and Indonesia. So this call focused on universal access, international cooperation, and solidarity. And it points to concrete measures to address key elements in this effort to um, uh, secure access, including uh, um, inventions, data, know-how, and biologic uh, materials that are instrumental uh, for manufacturing diagnostic tests, drugs, and vaccines. Um, notably, the call was not restricted by the type of intellectual property, the technologies, or geographic scope. And uh, as Professor Moon pointed out, most recently, this initiative has been bolstered last week by a resolution uh, in the European Parliament, which called for the European Commission and EU member states to formally support the pool. Um, the Parliament's unequivocal support for the pool provides a strong mandate for the European Union's engagement and support. And I would say that moving forward, um, governments and funding agencies should assign intellectual property rights of COVID-19 technologies to WHO CTAP, including existing and future rights in patented innovations and designs, uh, regulatory uh, test data, know-how, cell lines, and blueprints for manufacturing devices, vaccines, uh, and tests. Um, now, if I may uh, switch gears briefly to the WTO, I would like to highlight two developments. Uh, firstly, um, in May um, 20 of, of this year, uh, Bert Lang, the chair of the INTA commission, uh, committee, the International Trade Commission Committee at the European Parliament, wrote uh, the EU Trade Commissioner, Phil Hogan, seeking clarification on the European Union's decision to opt out of a mechanism in the WTO rules on pat patents designed to enable uh, WTO members to import drugs, vaccines, or diagnostic tests manufactured under a compulsory license in another country. Now, uh, Commissioner Hogan provided the following nuanced uh, response on the 26th of May. And I quote, with regard to the question concerning the EU's ability to import a future cure, vaccine, or other needed medicines produced abroad, I would like to note that the EU remains one of the leading regions in the world with a large scale pharmaceutical manufacturing capacity, in particular for vaccine production. However, the Commission is also very well aware of the discussion on upscaling production and the complex global supply structure of me medicinal products. The commission is monitoring the situation carefully and will not hesitate to take the necessary steps if the need arises, also as regards the EU's non-importer status under Article 31 bis of the TRIPS agreement." End quote. So as I see it, um, Commissioner Hogan's response to the parliament leaves the door open to revisiting the EU's decision to opt out of Article 31 bis of TRIPS as an importer. This is significant because there has been a debate on whether or not WTO members that initially opted out as importing members can ever change their minds. At least in this communication, uh, Commissioner Hogan has indicated that changing the status is on the guards and this will have a political consequence on any uh, subsequent uh, WTO decision. Um, now, more recently, in June, uh, the WTO convened an informal meeting of the TRIPS Council. At this consultation, 
the ACP group um, expressed their concerns that, and I quote, the unprecedented global health crisis caused by COVID-19 represents a challenge to the essential security interest of all countries. Access to affordable uh, medicines, vaccines, and diagnostics, as well as to the technologies to produce them, are indispensable to fight against this pandemic. Such technologies should be broadly available to manufacture and supply what is needed to address the pandemic." End quote. And uh, this was echoed by uh, India and South Africa at this informal. Now, on the topic of domestic manufacturing capacity, which Professor Moon uh, spoke about, S South Africa highlighted the inadequacies of Article 31 bis, intimating that it was not fit for purpose in relation to the COVID-19 uh, pandemic. And I quote, in this context, access to Article 31 bis of the TRIPS agreement may not be effective in securing access to much needed pharmaceuticals, medical devices, technologies, or rather therapeutic technologies, diagnostics uh, to address the health impact of COVID. In this context, IP rights may constitute a barrier to the diagnosis, treatment, and overall management of COVID-19 and comorbidities. Multilateral cooperation is going to be critical in ensuring an effective response to the pandemic and may require drawing from both current and past experiences in finding an innovative solution to this unprecedented crisis, end quote. So in um, closing, I would say that while many countries have waxed lyrical about the need to, for solidarity and for a collective response to COVID-19, I would say that the formal test will um, come up at the upcoming TRIPS Council session on July 30th and also the subsequent session in October. Um, I would say my final question um, to the audience and also to the conveners and Professor Moon is, how will the system respond uh, to the exigent needs for rapid access and deep technology transfer? Uh, thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Piru. And I think uh, your, your last point is certainly uh, a good starter also for, for the discussion uh, that we, we, can, we can have now. And some of the questions are, are already coming in. I would encourage the audience to, uh, to keep uh, asking questions in the, in the Q&A box. And perhaps I will take Tiro's last point and, and bounce it back to, to Suri for a, for a moment. And, um, perhaps also add to that, um, I think your, your remark on the whether there is a sufficient or adequate legal and, and policy space in the, in the trade regime, I think uh, it goes, goes together with uh, the points that Thiru just made. What, in, what are your views on um, what you've been seeing at the, at the WTO? Are there, are there moving pieces in, in your views uh, that more policy space will be created? Or, um, or what, what, are, what are your views, uh, your, your perspectives on that? Sorry, I, th I think that question was for um, Diru, right? Well, also, also for, for your views on, on that. So you... Um, so that was yeah. my question, I thought. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> to everyone else. <laughs> Okay. Uh, just because I, I think he's much better placed than me to comment on the on the WTO, um, but uh, you know, very very briefly, I would I would say that the the um, big barrier up until now has been political, uh, and I think that was clearly recognized in the UN Secretary General's um, high level report on on access to medicines, where the political pressure put on countries not to make use of TRIPS flexibilities uh, was was um, explicitly recognized as a as a barrier to their use. I think the question remains open as to whether COVID will shift the um, the politics as uh, uh, as happened, you know, back in 2001, when the um, on the eve of the Doha Declaration being agreed, uh, some may recall that um, 
it was right after the US uh, had threatened a compulsory license on ciprofloxacin in response to uh, anthrax, what was perceived to be an anthrax bioterrorism attack. And so the situation is quite similar today where you have a number of countries experiencing firsthand the um, uh, profound health and economic and security threats that come with infectious disease outbreaks. And they, I think, are reminded of how important it is to have all the tools available at their disposal. Uh, and so political opposition to the use of these flexibilities becomes untenable as happened 19 years ago. Um, whether that whether the current pandemic will shift the politics substantially so that something is made more solid, I think is a key question. You know, do we move, for example, to a revision of trips? And many people have been um, hesitant to reopen trips for renegotiation. Uh, but is that something that might happen? Do we move to something that uh, solidifies even further the status of the Doha Declaration? I mean, all topics for the negotiators at the WTO to um, to address. Over. Thank you. Um, I'm going to just uh, read here one of the, the first questions that came in during the, the presentation is on what are the, the main barriers preventing widespread use of compulsory licenses in order to enable local access and production of COVID-19 technologies if compulsory licenses are indeed legal? Perhaps I first ask uh, Tiru to comment on this. Uh, sure. I would say that it um, in many of the cases, uh, it's the question of um, um, political will. And even, even though uh, we've seen a spate of activity, a flurry of activity in the response to COVID, especially among high income countries, as uh, Professor Moon has pointed out. So for example, in the notifications to the TRIPS Council recently, uh, we've seen uh, communications by Hungary or Canada uh, alerting the membership as to um, move their moves to you know, make the issuance of a compulsory licensing easier. I, I think uh, for many countries, it's still um, onerous. Uh, and in as was raised by in the recent uh, informal, um, some developing countries uh, said that even with these flexibilities or even with um, legislation on compulsory licensing, they still find it onerous to issue compulsory licenses. And therefore, I think some of the discussion uh, in the informal you know, I think they're sort of presaging that there needs to be some sort of systemic response. But the question is, what exactly? And I think um, what I've been hearing is that, um, you know, one sort of maybe sort of, let's say soft, um, you know, like a soft way to address this is that uh, I think countries will call for basically a seminar at the TRIPS Council to really uh, plow through these issues and address, like, come up with a systemic response to what countries can do to affect, um, basically enable deep technology transfer. Because I think, um, you know, um, Professor Moon also mentioned that um, there was quite a vigorous di discussion on, um, you know, public goods and, you know, what, what, uh, what, you know, what, what did countries mean by that? And I think, you know, for us, it's, you know, it's one thing about the allocation of goods, but there's a broader question about um, the hoarding of intellectual property. And to affect deep technology transfer, you really need to sort of um, untangle these knowledge, these barriers. Thank you, Tiro. Um... Sorry, I don't know if you want to specifically comment on this because there's a, a range of questions coming in and perhaps I, uh, there's, there's one specifically uh, uh, asking for, for your feedback. So um, during the World Health Assembly, one observed how some low income countries and particularly uh, there's reference made to the Francophone African countries um, have difficulties on 
in relation to the digital divides and accessibility to join some of the platforms. So this actually speaks to the, the govern question around the governance mechanisms. And so the question is during unprecedented times and uh, in times where these crucial decisions are being made, um, how do we ensure that every voice is really um, heard, um, both I think at the WHO, uh, which is what the question is asking, but same for, uh, for the WTO and the discussions that will be upcoming in the, in the TRIPS Council. Yeah, I think it's it's a really important question about governance and, and process, and and um, you know there's no replacement as as uh, we're all aware for in person interaction and the informal interaction and the hallway conversations and the negotiations that happen uh, during you know a, a normal um, assembly. And indeed, we saw during the virtual WHA lots of technical. Um, issues and and not only with the the lowest income countries by the way i think it really was a, a challenge that um, many different countries across all levels of income faced um i i do think that that uh, you know, there was such a strong push also to have agreement. I mean, there were of course weeks of, of tough negotiations as, um, as Thera highlighted in his remarks, um, but I, I think there was such a strong need to come to an agreement um, that uh, I mean, in, in some ways perhaps this, this facilitated um, getting, um, you know, making sure that, that, that certain interest would be would be uh, respected but I think uh, the jury's still out I would say on exactly who was most disadvantaged by um, by the format on the one hand uh, you have technical issues on the other hand you're not limited by a you know a very small delegation being able to fly all the way to Geneva or spend you know spend 10 days here um, but if I may I wanted to pick up on on one other theme sure. uh, that was raised which was regarding technology transfer um, and whether for example overcoming patent barriers or issuing compulsory licenses would be would be adequate and I think that unfortunately in this case for many technologies um, it, it will not be adequate to ensure equitable access and um, for vaccines, uh, in particular, which are getting a lot of attention these days, I think overcoming the IP barriers is a necessary but not sufficient um, uh, step to facilitating, for example, uh, widespread production in lots of different countries and, and rapidly scaled up production. And the ideal scenario is that you have the technology holder voluntarily sharing and voluntarily engaging in the transfer of uh, know-how because now we don't have any time to waste. Time is really of the essence. And so, of course, it's it's better to have a you know, willing voluntary sharing of technology uh, and an embrace of the idea that having distributed production um, and and uh, competitive production is, is in the interests of everybody. And this is why I think the, the high level political um, statements and commitments that were made at the beginning of the assembly are very important. You know, when you have uh, the heads of some of the most powerful countries on the planet committing to make a vaccine available as a global public good or to make all medicines available as a global public good, I really think that it's, it's critical for civil society and media and the broader public to hold those leaders to account and to uh, insist that they live up to those commitments because that political backing is what is going to accelerate I think the most. Of course countries need to have negotiating leverage the more they're able to negotiate and to be able to use different tools uh, such as compulsory licensing the better position they'll be in to get access to the technology they need but the, the, the optimal solution is, is really to have uh, uh, you know, strong political backing for rapid, uh, voluntary um, transfer of technology. Thank you. Um, I'm going to throw another uh, question, but being mindful mindful of the time, and there's always uh, yeah too little time uh, to discuss and go through everything. But <clears throat> one that uh, relates to an early proposal made at the WTO by Sweden and Norway to negotiate an essential health goods agreement to regulate global trade in the scarce essential goods during a global crisis. Um, any, um, any comments from, from either of you on the developments of, of such proposal, um, where that might stand and, um, and how that might, might be picked up at the WTO? Tiru or Suri? I have not seen the text of that particular proposal uh, mentioned by Marcella, so I, I couldn't comment. 
I believe I'd seen an early like, or a different, maybe similar proposal by New Zealand and Singapore um, to that effect. But uh, what struck me, I mean, this, I had a, just a cursory reading of it uh, when it was, when it came out, but in terms of looking at the annexes, some, some of the um, annexes covered ag like agricultural goods. So, um, you know, I, I think perhaps the scope could have been narrowed to real, you know, essential health goods. That, that's my only comment on, on, on that particular proposal. But I, I don't know, I have not seen the text that Marcella uh, raised. Unfortunately, I don't have any further further um, insight to add, but a great question for those those uh, delegations. Um, I, I I did want to highlight, and perhaps you know, seeing that we're they're reaching the end of the the hour, uh, one of the big questions for for the trade regime, and I think that is um, coming back to the question of technology transfer. Because the one of the purposes of TRIPS was supposed to be the dissemination of technology, industrialization, uh, development, um, and industrialization more more broadly. And you know, clearly, this has not been the effect of the agreement. Uh, and I do think that you know, this is one of the reasons why the UN Technology Bank was created as part of the SDG process to kind of um, address this ongoing unmet need. Uh, and, and this bank has become involved again in the COVID um, context with the UN Technology Access um, Partnership. Um, but I, I do think for trade negotiators, it is important to come back to that original purpose and that question, you know, are there ways we need to change the rules to ensure a more equitable um, dissemination and, and transfer of technology? And for, for the health community, I think for, you know, on these questions around outbreaks and the international health regulations, the trade regime and trade rules have, have not been responsive enough. You know, we've not found that when you have unjustified trade restrictions um, emerging has happened uh, to Mexico. We've not found the trade regime responsive enough in addressing those. Now we have, you know, I would argue, uh, disastrous if, you know, some would argue justified export bans on medical equipment. Again, we don't find that the trade regime is able to handle these. And so I think we, we really need to take a hard look, you know, what are some of the changes in rules or incentives that are needed so that we're not um, uh, relying on a set of rules that, 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 and a set of dispute settlement processes that, that just are not, not responsive enough to um, fast moving health, uh, health challenges. Thank you very much, uh, Suri, for those uh, those remarks because I think that gives us an, an excellent uh, segue into into closing this this webinar, um, which is only I think the the first and the start of uh, of IAC also looking closer at this topic. That's indeed saying the current trade rules are not sensitive enough or not uh, responsive enough to what we circumstances such as we see we see today. Um, before um, passing the, the for final remarks to Professor Benge, um, I just want to invite uh, Tiru if he has some final reflections on where he thinks um, the discussion around COVID is or is not accelerating actually this broader discussion at the WTO uh, in terms of um, looking and, and changing some of the, the trade rules uh, in, the, in that regard, perhaps with the upcoming meetings that, that you've already been uh, reflecting upon of the, the TRIPS Council. Well, I would just say that um, in the last few sessions of the TRIPS Council over the last two years, um, certain developing countries have brought out a, a sort of standalone issue under the item uh, intellectual property and the public interest. And actually the origin of it uh, relates directly to the UN high level uh, uh, report uh, that um, Suri just mentioned. Actually, there was a time, this was uh, before, the, um, before Dr. Tedros took over. At WHO, um, it was very controversial to discuss the UN high level panel's report on access to medicines. In fact, actually, it was practically blocked um, at the EB, whereas at the TRIPS Council, um, developing countries, including India, Brazil, China, South Africa, they brought this up uh, and 
under that, they discuss many issues, in con including competition, transparency, um, compulsory licensing. So I'm providing this background just to say that I would think that perhaps given um, you know, the, the interesting discussions we've had in the informal on, on the systemic issues that COVID presents, and it's not just a health issue as, you know, as many have highlighted, it, it has destroyed economies. I, I think that you know, that would be the space to look at uh, and you know we should know um, in the uh, coming weeks. Uh, so I, I would really try to pay attention to the um, upcoming TRIPS Council and see any proposals um, related to COVID-19. Thank you. I would just um, briefly add uh, in response to a number of comments that came up about the private sector and, and to what extent is it possible to persuade uh, the private sector to share it, its IP. Um, I think if there's one lesson coming out of the COVID pandemic, it is the return of the strong state. And we've seen that the state is able to restrict our movements and make us uh, adopt all sorts of behaviors that are not, not what we would normally do. Uh, massive economic um, uh, stimulus and, and you know, debt spending. The, the, the state has come back in a way that I think many would not have believed six, six months ago. And that is um, equally true in the, the field of, of, of R&D, that the state or states the public sector has been accompanying and uh, subsidizing and de-risking the R&D process for um, drugs and vaccines uh, from the very beginning all the way through to the end where, where we were talking about advanced market commitments, you know, per states committing to, to purchase products. And so given the ubiquitous role of the state in managing this market for health technologies, I think that it is really in the power of states, it's in the hands of government to create the right set of incentives or laws or requirements such that IP and technology is shared in questions uh, and, and comments and for the um, for the answers also to the many questions that, that we've uh, we've received from uh, from the audience thank you very much also to our audience uh, for uh, for listening but also for participating uh, through your questions and um, uh, professor Macan I'm going to pass over to you for the closing thank of, you. The, of the webinar. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Lisbeth. Uh, many, many thanks to Suri and, 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 and Tiru. Uh, very fascinating presentation, Suri, and, and, and Tiru, very great and sort of provocative uh, remarks and, and, and comments. I, I think we couldn't dream uh, of, of, of better to, to, to launch this uh, new series on, uh, on, on trade. So it was, I think, fascinating. I thank also very much the, the participants uh, for the questions and, uh, and, and, and comments. And uh, I, I wish to everybody a good day because I'm not sure of who, who is where, but uh, I'm looking forward uh, to, the, to the next edition of, uh, of our trade knowledge series. And uh, again, thank you very much, Suri, Tiru, and Lisbeth. Thank you also for a great moderation. Bye-bye to all. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Bye, thank you.